I'm very happy and pleased this evening um, to welcome uh, the Assistant Secretary General of NATO for Emerging Security Challenges, uh, Dr. Antonio Misiroli. Dr. Misiroli is assumed his office most recently, and he comes from our world, from the world of uh, policy, of think tanks. Uh, until most recently, he, chair, he directed the European Union's official think tank, the Institute for Strategic Study, or as better known as EUISS. And we are very privileged and honored to have him with us this evening. Dr. Misiroli, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, let me start by saying how happy I am to be in Israel and by thanking Amos and the organizers for the kind invitation. NATO and Israel enjoying a long relationship of partnership and cooperation spanning more than two decades since the creation of NATO's Mediterranean Dialogue in 1994. And since May, 2016, exactly two years ago, Israel also has its own ambassador and office at our headquarters. Throughout this time, Israel has been, for NATO, a committed and reliable partner, willing to contribute its experience to the advancement of our cooperation. Israel has indeed a lot to contribute in security terms as a result of the specific threats and challenges it has to face but also of the energy and innovativeness of what is rightly called the start-up nation. This label is all the more significant for a country that has just turned 70 and gives hope to all those among us who are also approaching the threshold. Personal considerations apart, this applies also to NATO. NATO is just one year, exactly one year younger than the state of Israel, and we'll celebrate our own anniversary in April next year. I'm happy to be not only in Israel, but specifically in Herzliya and the Herzliya Conference, Israel's flagship event on security and global issues. At a time of major security challenges for this region, this is definitely the pace to be, to gather a better understanding of how turbulence in the Middle East may affect the rest of the world. And the previous session, uh, piles up additional fresh evidence to this claim. In my remarks, I will focus primarily on two sets of issues that lie within my broad specific responsibilities at NATO, but are also of great relevance to Israel. First, counterterrorism. The fight against terrorism does not start with killing the bad guys, nor does it end there. The people in Israel and in the wider region here are well placed to know this. Fight against terrorism is a complex and long-term endeavor that requires a comprehensive and long-term approach by the international community. And NATO is playing its part. Knocking down doors in the middle of the night to kill terrorists is a job often carried out by highly trained special forces. It's not so much the job of an alliance, rather, NATO's efforts focus on boosting security at home within allied countries and helping partners build their own ability to fight terrorism. Although NATO has been involved in this fight since at least 20, uh, 2001, when it invoked Article 5 of the Washington Treaty in support of the United States, uh, States after 9-11, yet uh, 2017 marked a turning point for NATO and counterterrorism. When NATO leaders met in Brussels in May last year, they took some very important decisions to announce roles, NATO's role in counterterrorism. They endorsed an ambitious 38 point action plan covering areas such as intelligence, operations, and capacity building and partnerships. More specifically, NATO announced its engagement in Afghanistan to ensure the country never again becomes a terrorist safe haven. There are thousands of troops on the ground as part of NATO's resolute support mission, training and advising local forces. NATO leaders also decided that NATO should become a full member of the global coalition to defeat ISIS. 
As such, NATO representatives have been attending most meetings of the coalition over the past year. And this has proved important to better coordinate various capaci capacity building and training efforts in Iraq. And NATO continues to provide OWAC's support to the coalition. NATO leaders also decided to establish a terrorism intelligence cell in the intelligence division at NATO headquarters. Together with a team of people based in NATO's Joint Force Command in Naples, what we call the hub for the South, the new intelligence cell helps raise awareness of and better anticipate terrorist threats. Overall, NATO has made steady progress in implementing the action plan on fighting terrorism. But there, are, there is more work to be done. This is true when it comes to NATO's work with partners, notably those that are facing active terrorist threats. Helping partners to build or build up their own ability to fight terrorism will be an important deliverable at the upcoming NATO summit in July, where allies may also decide to upgrade their ongoing activities in Iraq to a fully-fledged NATO mission. And we do all this through training, education, and exercises, through science and technology development, and through consultations and information sharing. In all this, Israel is a natural partner for NATO, with its operational experience, its analytical expertise, and its technical capabilities. For instance, on non-proliferation and CBRN, Israel participates in exercise and in scientific progress, pro projects through the Science for Peace and Security program. And today, literally as we speak, or as the previous speakers were doing their job, the political director of the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Alon Ushpitz, was addressing the North Atlantic Council on the security situation in the region in the first ever NAC plus one, NAC plus Israel meeting uh, held so far. But NATO's cooperation with Israel is crucial to another set of issues that are part and parcel of my daily work at NATO. Cyber defense supports NATO broader deterrence and defense mission. Over the years, NATO policies on cyber defense have developed in response to evolutions we have witnessed in the cyber threat landscape. Since the initial creation of NATO's computer incident response capability in 2002, we have moved from addressing cyber defense as a purely technical issue to seeing it, more than a decade later in 2017, as an inherent part of NATO's strategic reality. We have moved to some extent from information assurance to mission assurance because our armed forces and militaries are not immune to cyber risks and increasingly rely on cyberspace to carry out missions and operations. In the past, aggressive activities by other states uh, was, were obvious in the forms of tanks or soldiers crossing a border. Today, things are not that straightforward anymore. We see the use of cyber tools as instruments of state policy and political influence, from disinformation and intellectual property theft to cyber intrusions evolving into a potent instrument of hybrid warfare. At least so far, the vast majority of hostile activities that use cyberspace as a vehicle lie below the threshold of an armed aggression. Espionage, sabotage, disruption, subversion. Old activities carried out by new means, by other means, if I may quote von Clausewitz low cost and high impact. We sometimes believe that we are in an article four and a half situation, one that requires increased awareness, preparedness, and resilience. At the same time, it is hard to imagine a conflict in the near future that would not include a cyber dimension. While cyber warfare proper is probably unlikely, cyber in warfare is already a reality. So NATO is determined to strengthen its cyber defenses and stay ahead of the curve. NATO allies have indeed recognized that cyber attacks can reach a threshold that threatens national and Euro-Atlantic prosperity, security, and stability. So cyber defense has been recognized as part of NATO's core task of collective defense. Allies have also recognized that international law 
applies in cyberspace, as well as acknowledged the need to optimize the ability of cyber instruments to support traditional military operations in other domains. The guiding principle is that NATO must be able to defend itself as effectively in cyberspace as it does in other domains, on the ground, at sea, and in the air. As part of the three-year roadmap to implement NATO's decision to recognize cyberspace as a domain of operations adopted in 2016, we are looking into and developing further how we think, train, equip, and collaborate in this sphere. In February, NATO defense ministers endorsed the creation of a cyber operations center at SHAPE, NATO's military headquarters, to help integrate cyber aspects into NATO planning and operations at all levels as part of a broader adaptation of the NATO command structure to ensure that the alliance is fit for purpose. Moreover, allies are actively implemented what we call the Cyber Defense Pledged, adopted at the 2016 Warsaw Summit to strengthen and enhance the cyber defenses of their national networks and infrastructures as a matter of priority. The first progress report based on the allies' own implementation of the pledge is being developed in view of the forthcoming summit in Brussels. But I can already tell you <coughs> that strategic level attention on cyber defense and, uh, has been held by the pledge and has been used as a tool by allies to promote and prioritize investment in this area at domestic level. As you may have heard or read yourself, recently a number of European countries in particular have decided to significantly increase the human and budgetary resources for cyber defense, an area where public opinion too seems much more open to raise expenditure than on conventional defense. And this is certainly due to the growing awareness that our economies, as well as our democracies, are increasingly exposed to what we officially call malicious cyber activities. Finally, cyber defense is a team sport. We recognize that we cannot go it alone when it comes to tackling cyber threats. We are part of an ecosystem, and we fully recognize the multi-stakeholder nature of cyberspace. And allow me to take this opportunity to thank Israel for its engagement with NATO on cyber defense. To give you an example, last June, Israel addressed NATO's Cyber Defense Committee, setting out its national approach to cyber defense. And we are looking at opportunities to cooperate more together, including on information sharing, training, and exercises. I myself will be back in this country next month to participate in the annual Cyber Week that takes place here. More broadly, NATO has taken steps to intensify cooperation, in particular with the European Union. Real-time information exchange between the incident responses communities of both NATO and the EU continues to take place through a technical arrangement on cyber defense concluded in early 2016. We recognize as well the importance of the private sector, as it is they, after all, who develop and operate the vast majority of net networks worldwide. Through the NATO Industry Cyber Partnership, our continuous interaction with industry partners helps provide advance notice and rapid mitigation of many activities that have been detected against systems in allied nations and at NATO itself. During the WannaCry incident last May, for instance, we, we quickly reached out to our industry partners and the information exchange was critical for getting the most up-to-date picture of a rapidly evolving and complex situation. NATO also supports activities designed to limit the risk of conflict in cyberspace. While NATO itself is not a norms-setting organization, the Alliance follows, welcomes, and supports the work undertaken in other international fora, such as the OSCE or the UN Group of Governmental Experts, including efforts related to confidence-building measures and the development of voluntary international norms or responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Now more than ever, we need to reinforce our efforts to build a more transparent and stable cyberspace to underpin a global framework to promote cyber stability. Ladies and gentlemen, the traditional mission of NATO has been collective defense, hard security and defense. 
but many of the responses, particularly to below the threshold activities, fall outside the scope of traditional military responses. We need to bring together more diverse actors than in the past, even when handling, for example, nuclear deterrence or missile defense, which used to involve more limited and homogeneous circles. And we are approaching, as we are approaching our 70th anniversary ourselves, we look to work increasingly with partner countries, such as Israel, as well as other international organizations and industry and academia on information sharing, training and education, exercises, and so on. We are continuing to develop our capabilities, boost our skills, share best practices, and enhance information exchange. Because we have to be as effective in the virtual world as we are in the physical world to ensure that our commanders are equipped for the operations and mission of the 21st century and to protect, in particular, our common values and way of life in the digital age. Thank you very much.